Hey everyone, we've got teacher Andrew and he's actually one of my favorite people to talk to. Um, you know, Andrew is a funny guy. He always has this laughing. And um, today earlier I had the people on from India, which was quite interesting to have. And now we're gonna do it from an American teacher point of view with Andrew. Andrew is, is like a math genius. I call him the math genius with the Nobel Peace Prize that I believe he's gonna win one day for math. And the reason why I wanted Andrew to come on because Andrew deals with students who really need our support. And sometimes they don't get what they need because they're, as we say at the UN, they're left behind sometimes in different urban communities. So Andrew, welcome and thank you for being with the Creators 2030 here. Thank you. Andrew, before we get into some fun stuff and joking stuff, I want to start off kind of serious sure. for just a minute. Um, you know, we have gone from a COVID-19 situation where students were under lockdown for almost a year and a half, okay? And now they've been thrusted back into schools all over the world, okay? I feel personally that we have not supported them in um, from that movement from being online all day to now being thrusted back into school. And I'd like to share with you one thought. You know Nicole. Nicole shared yes. today that um, she becomes exhausted when her, even though she's glad to be back at school and seeing her friends, her friends are exhausted because they're so used to sitting behind. I think we lost you, Andrew. They're so used to. We, they're so used to being behind a screen that now that she's just going out to go to school and be with her friends or just getting work done, she's absolutely exhausted because, you know, just the mental exhaustion of being out when they're so used to being behind the screen. So I want to ask you, that is from someone who's in South America. What has it been like for your students? What has it been like for you as a teacher and the parents? I can, well... I'm also working on my PhD, so I can say as a student, you know, you know, with, uh, you know, who's also a teacher noticing that, you know, for me, the classes that I've been attending have been, you know, more challenging or at least different in that, you know, with that, that virtual space and, and kind of transitioning back into that is, is difficult even at a, at a, at a, you know, master's or PhD level. Um, I think what we've seen with the students is, um, you know, you think about the, the, the tenth graders, and we call them, you know, the sophomores, the, the second year of high school. Well, a lot of them, they're, they're actually in their first year of high school because they didn't, their first year of high school was at home. And so a lot of the, um, the maturity aspects that you get from, you know, having a year, getting used to the teachers and, and how high school is different, you know, you're actually seeing that happening now um, in the tenth grade rather than in the ninth grade. Um, wow. Wow. Um, on the other hand, you know, we, we do, we are at a position where, you know, we're a school that's been traditionally um, understaffed. And one thing the pandemic has done is we have become fully staffed. And so we are actually seeing smaller classes, a little bit better technology. We obviously updated our infrastructure. And so we have been able to support the students a lot more. What, what have you seen, you know, as I said, I want, I think it's important for parents to hear this and things like that. What has it been like when you're dealing with the parents as a teacher, um, Andrew, and trying to get them to understand and dealing with the students who are coming back to you in a public school? I think that the um, the parents have been really, you know, the, the parents understand what's going on in the, in the community and with the students. And I think that when, you know, when we were out, the thing that the parents dealt with for the first time was, you know, seeing what they're what they can be like all day and how, you know, all the things that we have to manage in, you know, managing their social, emotional behavior and that kind of thing. Um, but, um, the parents have been pretty supportive. It's just, you know, knowing that the, you know, we're having to kind of readjust to what school is like at a time when in later high school classes become a little bit more, um, difficult. You're getting ready for, you know, pre-college and getting ready for college classes. And the expectation is 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 more than what it used to be and there's a transition a natural transition anyway and it's just transition that you had a uh, you know a gap in there mm -hmm. um i guess my next thing for you is you're in a school that you have helped to trans 
transition students into be becoming academically powerful, okay, in different ways. With yes. the pandemic, you know, if you would explain, your school is in an area that people would consider a rough area, okay? How have you as a teacher been able to do that and navigate that, especially during COVID-19? Um, I think where we are is we're all, we also happen to be in a city that's transforming very quickly. That, that um, the, the Nashville, Tennessee is, is a very, um, we're seeing a lot of people moving into the area from California, from, from Texas, from large, you know, some larger states. And, um, and it's uh, changing the, the, the uh, to a degree, some of the the, the students that we see, um, in terms of their backgrounds and and things like that, um, and I'll probably say in a positive way because we're able to kind of give a little bit more focused attention um, with a school that's a little bit smaller. I think in the last three years we went from about ten, maybe about a thousand students to about seven hundred. Um, I, I was you know commenting with some of the other teachers today that. You know, we ha we haven't had the behavior issues we've had before. We still have you know some, you know, rough times and and just you know, students being rude or things like that. But we really haven't had like I'm like I haven't had to you know, uh, call campus security to have a student removed for you know for a long time. And sometimes that you know that that happens. But um, I think you know all in all, I think the students are really happy to you know to be back, um, and you know have that opportunity. What is the one thing that people don't realize? You know, we hear a lot of things in the news, but you are a teacher who's been able to get through to students in ways that many others haven't. We hear on the news that, oh, you know, how are, the, how are these students dealing with the, you know, having to be, you know, uh, mandated vaccines or having to wear um, the mask over their face all day? How are they dealing with that, Andrew? Um. A lot of them are kind of, you know, dealing with the same way that that they're, the, they're seeing their parents do, or or, or in the news, and and um, but at the same time, you know, I've had I've I've had people ask me, you know, are the students responding because of, you know, Tuskegee and things like that? I'm like, not really. That's not really what's coming in. It's just they're just hearing like, okay, mandate this and Joe Biden that and Republican this and Democrat that, um, but, you know, a lot of it, you know, we always had to, you know, the I guess back and forth about you know take your hat off and pull your pants up and you know the kinds of things you do in school. Um, it's just that you know this one's got a little bit more of a uh, you know people getting sick uh, behind it. What is what what do your in your in your personal opinion? What do your students or any students fear the most during these times? Hmm. I think they fear uncertainty. I think that when, you know, we don't know, know when the masks thing is going to stop or, you know, and, and I would assume, you know, you know, I've had a couple students that have had to quarantine recently and a couple that had, you know, a sibling or a family member in an ICU and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it's just been, been tough to try to, you know, navigate those things of, of you know, kind of same as if a, if a student had a sick parent or, or sick, uh, sorry, uh, situation going on that, you know, just kind of looking at how to coach them through it and also the, the you know, adolescent experience. You said something very powerful earlier, um, sure. Andrew, and there's some questions coming in. Uh, for, actually, this is questions coming in from South America. Um, they wanted to ask, as a teacher, you just said that parents now understand what it's like to have to deal with the students during the day because they've had them all day every day okay mm -hmm. what is it that you feel that you know on world teachers day to day that we don't really understand that teachers deal with even now pre-covid covid and during this process of covid what don't we get as everyday people when we just said oh send them to school have the teachers do this or that what don't we get that as an experienced teacher the things that have to be managed at the same time um, which I'm sure is the same as, you know, um, 
you know, when you're dealing with, you know, parenthood, you know, juggling jobs and soccer and, and this thing and that thing that you have to do. But but also at the same time, I have to be aware of where my students are emotionally and academically because I need to know, you know, when do I apply pressure on them for, um, you know, to get this this, you know, math thing or you know, maybe I'm teaching this math thing, but I'm really, the thing that I really need to teach them is to take notes properly or have you um, brought your book to class? I mean, the, you, that seems minor, but you know, the thing that I really am teaching with certain lesson is I need you to make sure you have your materials in class um, or, uh, you know, how do I get you ready so that when you get to college algebra, uh, you're able to get through it the first time. For most of my students, that's going to be the difference between them getting an associate's degree or not, if that's the direction they're going in, or if they're going vocational, you know, what what do they, I, I have to be responsible for what do they need from my message, and, um, you know, at the same time, when you may have disturbances in the hallway, and there's, you know, people going by me right here, and, uh, you know, I'm sure someone in the next five minutes away for get my attention and then just I have to mentally be able to come back to message. And if there was a student here, I could be tutoring them at the same time. And and, uh, you know, just looking at all of those things, cognitive psychology, in my case, advanced mathematics and, and all that sort of thing. Now, let's get to the fun stuff. <laughs> so what are some of the things that you do? To, that have that you've been very successful. You and I've talked over the years. What have been some of the some of the things that you've gotten to, to support that students really just love that you get them to take math on? Um, a lot of students are going to be looking for you know when do I use this you know in in day to day life and and a lot of them don't have a lot of people in their immediate vicinity that have a strong math background and in fact I would even say for most of the adults around even the building, they would say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not a math person and that sort of thing. Um, and coming in as a mathematician, I'm saying there's no such thing as, you know, like, there's such thing as being good at bad at math. That's just something people say. If you like, like, I was a, a, a French horn player, or I am a French horn player. I played, you know, a week ago. And um, if I flicked up a totally different instrument, I wouldn't be good at it. But I wouldn't say I hate it. You know, I, I wouldn't say, oh, I hate the clarinet. I mean, maybe I don't want to play it at the moment, but that's, that's a weird way to describe something. Whereas, you know, when we start trigonometry, oh, I'm not good at that. Well, of course you're not. We have we haven't started it yet. We just started it. You know, you're you're three days into an entire discipline. You know, baby steps. Um, I think being able to say, hey, you know, that frustration you're feeling, that means you're in the right place. If you get every question right that I'm asking, you should be in the next class. You're just you know, you should be in, be in the wrong class. Um, and I think that's comforting. Of like, no, you're not supposed to be getting everything right. What are some of the things you do? Because you've had me laughing. What are some of the things that you do that has students feeling like I can rock this out? Um, I, what I hope to be for them is is kind of an example of how you integrate these things into your life. Um, um, like earlier today, um, I don't know if I can do this with my setup, but um, I, I found this uh, spider. And I was, I created a little pulley system so that I could drop it on people using the same, some of the same triangles I teach in, uh, in the math class. Um, and it was just, you know, kind of silly. Also, it's, you know, the fact that I'm, I'm able to tell them like, hey, this, this uh, animal doesn't really actually have the skeleton. So it's kind of funny that there's a, you know, spider skeleton, but spiders don't have, you know, bones in the same way that they, so, you know, whoever created that had some fun. Um, but that's one of those kind of fun applications of, um, you know, my subject. Or I'll walk into another teacher's room and, and you know, I'm knowledgeable enough that I can, you know, uh, you know, throw out a history thing. That's like, oh, good job, math teacher. Knows that too. Um, that's, kind of, that's kind of cool. And, you know, I have a student here right now who's asking a question of you. Sure. She's from Africa. And she said, she's like, Teacher Andrew, what, how does... Um, how does math help us with everyday life? So what we study in, can I just ask uh, what roughly what age? High school, middle school, or what would we? 16. 16, so we're looking about high school. Um, so the mathematics that we're studying, when we study algebra, geometry, and essentially combine those things, is we are looking at ways to model the things that we naturally encounter all the time anyway. 
there are very simple things that we encounter and there are very complicated things that we encounter, but all of those things together form uh, patterns and the, 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 the shapes that describe them form a very, um, it forms a system that allows us to really understand more complicated things in terms of, of other things. Like I pump gas and I, you know, or I, I, you know, purchase a product and, you know, for every one that I purchase, I get another one. Well, that graph is very much like this other graph and it's, it's shape is like this one. And we can eventually extend that into, for example, you know, when the pandemic hit, everyone saw all these, you know, graphs about, you know, uh, the pandemic, right? They had, everyone became an expert on exp exponents, right? Well, they were using what they knew about the graphs to, you know, make judgments or make, make claims about the world. And some of them uh, were incorrect. You know, viruses actually don't use a purely exponential because you can't go to infinity. They do this, kind of, I'm sorry, my finger's in the way. They do this kind of sigmoidal thing where they, you know, ramp back up. And so if you're looking at, you know, the way things work in the real world, you know, do your models, do, do your mathematics, um, you know, take into account those things. And so it's looking at patterns and, and dealing with them in a powerful way. Here's another question. Sure. Urban environments, you're dealing, you're over in the, you're over in an area that's very urban and students mm -hmm. who, you know, they would, they could, they would rather be somewhere else than in school. I mean, students sometimes feel that way anyway, mm -hmm. but it's harder for them. They're, it's harder for them because they're concerned about their parents and jobs and, you know, mm -hmm. they're going through some serious stuff. Um, how, how is it different? For, I know you've been at other schools that you've taught where, you know, the economics were different. What do you think that, what is the difference? You know, as a teacher who's been in a public school and then in another school where the economics were different, I want you to give us the real reality of it. I think in either, in either school, so I teach, you know, as a math teacher, I teach something where the, all of the students that I have served in both communities are, you know, legally required to take something and, and, and may to a slight degree kind of resent that they, you know, like, you know, I'm not, they're not necessarily taking the class because they want to, but because they have to. Um, there are, <clears throat> there are, um, I mean, let me say when you're looking at where you, um, the dreams and aspirations that you're putting together and, you know, the question of, well, who around you is able to coach you as far as how, how to um, get to those places. Um, you know, the students that have more people around them, more, you know, positive male role models or role models in general, um, you know, will have a better idea of how to approach uh, a situation. Whereas we have a lot of high school seniors. We just took the ACT um, today and you know the next conversation is, hey, you're almost done with high school. What are you doing next? And a lot of them haven't really started confronting that. Hey, your, you know, your journey is almost over, and the people you know in high school, you really won't know them that much longer. Um, and so, as a teacher, looking at how to make the connections where they may not have them naturally, um, and that's that's a big part of what what I do too is finding people in the community, even in, you know, like, like I, you know, you and I have talked about. Uh, certain students and, and um, you know, other people who are, you know, up to big things say, hey, like, let me connect you with these and say, see if they can give you some advice that uh, you might not otherwise have access to. Or, or even the fact that they might not even realize the beauty that's in them already, that they can do something. Right. And to bring it. And that's what I feel that you do with your students. You know, you're a wrestler. You do some video stuff with them. You know, and I think them seeing you as an everyday person who wanted to wrestle, who wanted to do certain things and has been able to go out and create that dream for himself. OK, mm -hmm. shows that they and still be a teacher, still go for your Ph.D. and still have high ideals for yourself where you're aspiring, even in excelling in your math levels. I and think to do them that, all at the same time. Right. And, and I think being able to do that. 
they have no, do you feel that, let me, let me just be straight about it. You work in an area where the, t the, the students are minorities. Okay. So, uh, you know, Hispanic, black, maybe some Asian, maybe whatever, uh, maybe native American. Let's be real. I hate to say it like this, but let's be realistic because we only have about 10 more minutes here. Sure. They have a harder time than maybe other cultures might. Okay. And they look and say, well, teacher, Andrew, you can do these things, but I may not be accepted to do those things. How do yeah. you empower them beyond that when that, that conversation in the world is real? I, I had a student last week um, that was you know wanted to be a police officer and we said hey why don't you go talk to the student resource officers she said well I'm, I'm kind of afraid to do that because i don't want the other students to see me you know talking to them they might think that i'm you know snitching or or, or something like that and i said well let's, let, let's when, when the hallway's clear sometime let's let me make the introduction and, and you know have a conversation that's less risky um you know that's some that might not have occurred to me if uh, like when i was a boy scout i just went and talked to the the police officer and um, I remember I had to do it for a merit badge, so I, I, you know, can kind of, you know, see that making that connection, which is just someone who you walk by every day, is a little bit more difficult. It, you know, t teaching kids who are in an urban environment who are minorities, what have you personally seen for yourself that has they have come up against because of the color of their skin? Um. And I want, I want to temper this, Andrew, by saying even within their own belief system. I, I tell you what I think. Um, one thing that I noticed about the, you know, the, the school community that I've served, I've been here in, in this community in, in two different schools for about five years, is there are very few, um, especially male um, uh, you know, African-American um, teachers that are younger than me. Um, that are, or, or I, I'm trying to think if we have any Hispanic males. We have, I think, maybe two. Um, that are in their, their 20s. And so um, finding those people that, you know, you don't see people that look like you in the classroom that are, that are you know, within 20 years. Whereas I'm looking at this saying, hey, we've got a lot of really good jobs here. And if you guys would, you know, you actually, I, I was telling some students today, like, you know, you'd actually be a really good teacher. You don't have to get all of the stuff now to be able to get this. You'll get there. But the way that you're working together in those things, you'd be really good at, at you know, the positions that I'm in that, you know, as my career will eventually, eventually will take me out of teaching. I'll either go into, you know, stuff with PhD or wrestling or all at the same time. And it's like, hey, there's a lot of really good jobs and a lot of really good, um, you know, starting places. Like if you want to go into um, music, for example, a lot of students, they, you know, they want to go into music and, and they, they want to follow those dreams. And it's like, well, you know, the nice thing about me when I went into wrestling is I had a, a stable income with teaching and I'm able to use you know, my weekends and things like that and, and have a secure enough existence that, you know, if I have a, a promoter that's bullying me or taking advantage of me, I can say no. Um, and not everyone in wrestling, for example, has that opportunity. And obviously this, we've heard, you know, stories and music of, of people being taken advantage of. And, you know, if you've got secure work um, in a good field like teaching or, you know, other kinds of fields, we've got a lot of technology openings and it's just like, hey, how do we get these students into those jobs? Because truly, there aren't factories anymore. These are their jobs. We just have to connect the dots. My, you know, we have seven minutes left. And in part of that, I'd like to ask you something. Mm -hmm. Andrew, you've often had your thoughts about how we could do things in a better way, okay? Mm -hmm. For students. That, like the students you're teaching. And you know, I've tried to bring the students you're teaching together with other students around the world, okay? Um, sometimes it's hard to really get through to the students, you know, especially, and so I wanna ask you what the difference is between a male, a male, um, a male teacher and a female teacher in getting through to students in urban areas or in areas where it's, rougher and you know things of that nature i would also probably throw in their experience because as you do this job for a while you kind of learn how to um anticipate something where it's going to come up like i already know where the students are going to be cheating on an assignment three weeks from now and i've already got that so that you know it's going to happen i'm going to catch them this way and then it's going to be managed you know it's, just, it's not going to be something that's going to blow up in the hallway and, and things like that um when you look at 
differences between male and female teachers. Um, students are very, um, I don't know how to say this. It is very less likely for me to know something going on in their personal life. Um, I, I, if, if I hear something that happens, it's usually a year or two later. Like I know that there's, you know, um, obviously I know some of my, my kids are, are parents themselves or mothers and clearly there's fathers here, but I, I couldn't tell you any of them offhand and I, maybe they confide in, in uh, either the female teachers or, or something like that. I just not something that I'm really privy to. Um, and, you know, you really don't necessarily need me in that role. You really kind of need me in the advanced science role. Like, let me hand, let me, let me hold this space. And then, you know, there may be a different, you know, place for another professional there. Um, I also like, you know, when you need to get upset with students, you know, like, um, not so upset, but when you need to, you know, emphasis, like as a, like I'm six foot three, 270 pounds. If I um, am to, you know, seem aggressive to them, that can be really scary compared to, you know, a five foot one, 130 pound woman, you know? And so managing how to, you know, because, you know, I'm also you know showing them, hey, this is how you be a, a, a large man and in, in how you interact with people, you know, modeling, um, you know. That's, how a very, that's very yeah. powerful what you just said, because um, I would think that them seeing your size, they're like, oh, my God, he's, you know, I better not mess with him. But when there's certain teachers in front of the room, it's like, oh, I'll just get over on her or I'll get over on him because, you know, they're weak. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Would you and say it can, be as, it can be as simple as the way that you stand in front of the classroom? Because if I if if I stand in and you could think about, um, you know, like social, um, you know, like how to those how to how to make friends kind of thing about the way that you stand and the way that you project yourself. If if I'm taking a step forward versus, you know, I'm kind of taking a step back, like they'll they'll naturally pick up on that just as, you know, as any person would. Um, you know, subconscious. Yeah. I want to leave the rest of this time. We have like three minutes left. I want to leave the rest of this time for you to share things that you feel that we need to know publicly. Um, as teachers, we absolutely love the kids. Like, like the, teach, the, the, the kids are the reason we're here. And a lot of times you can have things with, uh, you know, the, 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 the issues that you have coming to school are always with the adults. Um, you know, one thing you have to communicate with kids is like, hey, I'm not mad at you. Like, I know you're yelling at me because something, you know, happened at, at home and, and I don't take it personally. It'll be the next day and, and whatever. I know that that's something we'll manage that. That's just something we deal with. But, you know, the, the, the real stuff we deal with as adults is that's the, you know, the things that make this job difficult. I want to say this in India, uh, one of the things that they do is the teachers get together for their own mental health. Mm -hmm. They speak with the parents. And they have the kids right there, you know, like when they were on virtual and everything, so that the kids would see that the teachers and the parents are working together. Mm -hmm. But they also, the teachers also would have meetings amongst themselves to deal with the mental health of their themselves and their own family and what they're dealing with or their own aspirations. So they're taking what they're teaching and being an example for themselves and for the parents and also supporting the parents if they've lost jobs or whatever. Do you do you do that at your school or and if you don't, do you think that's something that would be good if it was implemented here? No, we do. We have a lot of home visits that we do and have we did all through the pandemic to make sure we gotta make sure these kids have not only devices to learn from, but also we gotta make sure they have food and resources and stuff. And we have to be even in the pandemic, we still have to be the front line for making sure that, you know, hey, if something's going on, we need to be able to intervene as professionals. Um, as far as, you know, teachers getting together, but we've always gotten together, you know, sort of socially as, as, as workplace, but, you know, we also have, um, you know, different support groups as needed. Um, and everyone's got different things. Like some people would belong to a church and would go there for that. And, you know, a lot of times we don't always live right next to each other. A lot of us, you know, commute in, um, even to a school like this. Like I, I come in a half an hour and the guy across the hall from me, he lives in a different state and drives in. He just happens to like it here and just also likes where he lives. I see what you're saying. I, I think what I guess what I'm getting at is what they do in India is they get together, even if it's over Zoom, mm -hmm. and really support each other, or they get together while they're in school, and it's specifically to support each other in their individual pursuits, but also to find out what they're dealing with with students. Is that the kind of thing you're saying that you have going on at the school there, or is that something that you feel, Andrew, as a teacher, could be adopted more? 
I think we do a pretty good job of that. We have, I mean, we have our meetings. We have both academy meetings and, and department meetings. And, and, you know, when we have similar students at, at our particular school, we have a model where um, um, we actually have um, a Firestone has a facility in the building where we can get kids trained in, you know, vocational stuff. We've got other um, organizations in the building to get people. We have a clinic, a community clinic in the building that the kids can, you know, end up volunteering and things like that and also be a support for the community. So um, we do have a lot of really good um, things and the school really does serve as a major hub for, um, you know, coming together. Um, I think it does a really good job of, of those things. And, um, you know, they've had yoga and, and, and things like that regularly for, you know, people that wanted to have that kind of mental or, uh, you know, togetherness time. And again, you know, everyone's personality is different. Some people uh, had a little bit easier than others, and and some people have better support systems than others. So, just that's life. But I think we've done a pretty good job, uh, all in all, of managing, and especially that we're fully staffed that we weren't before. I think yeah, that's I, huge. I think I think it's huge in the per. And I'm not saying the other teachers aren't there. I mean, I commend all the teachers that work with you. Mm -hmm. But I've known you for a You're while. Great yeah, you have a great staff. And, and and what I want to say is the work that you have done personally, um, even with yourself of your own, um, you know, your own inner transformation, you always find a way to work with the students, work with the people mm -hmm. there, you know. And um, so if there's, you know, we're going to go and we thank you for being with us. Is there any last words, Andrew, you want to share? Um, I just think, you know, just, you know, we're, we're clearly in a transition phase before the pandemic. I think I had 10 computers in the room and they barely worked. And now every student, you know, ha has a computer, at least theoretically. And, and, you know, we're able to do things in the classroom that I never could do before because of the new technologies. And I think that we're, um, you know, I happen to be, I'm working on a doctorate in computational mathematics. And so a lot of the technology things may be easier for me than others, because I kind of know the, how the pro pro programmers can think. Um, and I think that as we start to use this technology, we're really going to be able to do things in the next 10 years that we weren't able to do before. And I think, you know, education is going to develop and just, you know, looking at how, uh, you know, how we, we move on with that. And I think that's going to be global. Well, I thank you for World Teachers Day. Um, oh, you know, Andrew, I have one question. I'm sorry before you go, that I think is really powerful for me. Um, you know, I love technology. Okay. Mm -hmm. But technology can also disconnect us from ourselves at times if we're always on it and you're not, you don't have a strong foundation within yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. You and I have been pretty lucky with, along with so many people around the world, the, some of the transformational work we've done in other um, disciplines. Okay. But for those who are students or, you know, who don't have that availability to them, Andrew. Do you feel that there's going to be a disservice or a detriment if students are just fully immersed in technology and we don't find a way to help them integrate nature and other things? I think that no matter what, we're already integrated in technology. It's just the way that we are in technology. A lot of my students, they know how to use parts of their phone, but they really, you know, when we gave them computers, they don't know how to use all these the programs. Microsoft Word and things like that. And when we have partner meetings, we say, hey, hey, what we could really use is these kids don't know how to use the basic uh, business functions. And, and some of them have about the computer literacy that my mom does. And, you know, God bless my mom, but she's 74 years old. And she tries. But, you know, um, we're getting these kids ready for being able to use all these things. A lot of them just have to kind of, you know, um, you know, learn how to use them. And I think that's going to come up from the uh, from the younger schools and things like that, the elementary now that they do have these technologies, because they will eventually have to learn how to use them. And, and as teachers, we will have to model, you know, I have to teach them in the next quarter for the first time ever, hey, this is how you type up a math assignment. Like, they've never done that before. Still even now, really? Well, they've never done that before. I've never, I've never taught it before because we didn't have the machines. And um, I didn't really use it even in graduate school. I always hand wrote everything out. Even I graduated 2018 with my master's in mathematics. And it's just the way I learned to do it. And now I'm like, you know, we probably need to learn how to do this because if you're going into science, this would make it easier for you. Hmm, really great. Well, thank you for your time, Andrew. And if you would just stay on with a second, we're sure. going to uh, just in the broadcast. Everyone, um, you know, Andrew's a very special guy to me and he has done some amazing work with students who 
are in areas that, you know, he, he saw a need and he actually created that need. And he creates it with fun and humor and like that thing that's in the back of him that has us laughing. <laughs> Paint's still wet. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just going to thank you, everyone. And, and Andrew, just stay with us for a second. Sure, well, thank you.